Welcome to the Docs Who Lift podcast, where we distill and simplify the complexities of a healthy lifestyle, exercise, medicine, and weight loss. We're excited to bring you a podcast that's a prescription for clinical practice, scientific recommendations, and just real life. This this is the Docs Who Lift podcast. Hey, hey Eliupa. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back to the Doc 2 Lift <laughs> Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Spencer Rodolski. I got my co host here, Dr. Carl, and we're continuing our discussion and series on medicines for weight loss, or as some people would say, obesity pharmacotherapy. Today, we're going to be talking about bupropion naltrexone along with fentramine topiramate. We've already discussed kind of the indications for uh, weight loss medicines. If you haven't listened to that one yet, make sure you listen to that. And we also discussed last time about uh, actually not even a drug, but a FDA-approved device called Planity, even though it's a pill. And we also discussed Orlistat, which inhibits uh, fat absorption. So now we're going to be talking more about the centrally acting agents uh, and, and these were approved around 2000, what was it, 2012, 2013, 14. <clears throat> um, yeah. Uh, and, for, but, the, although, for the combination. For pills. the combination. fentramine has been approved since the 1950s, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, for yeah. uh, short-term I weight loss. I always tell people that, yeah, fen- fentramine's like the old school appetite suppressant that's been around for a long time, has a good track record, actually. Actually, a pretty good safety record, by the way. Um, it's kind of the one that's te- you know tried and true over the the course of time, but um, for some reasons we can get into that are kind of nonsensical. Only approved for short term treatment of obesity, technically, although state to state, you know, different regulations and stuff are more lax. But um, but I, I think we could start there. I think we should start with phenamine. Yeah, not to be confused when we talked about think? this in the indication. Yeah, sure. Not to be confused with fenfen. Fentramine was a component of the fenfluramine fentramine combination that got taken off the market we discussed uh, in the indications uh, podcast uh, fentramine has not been shown to cause valvulopathy and um, it seems to be safe so let's start with fentramine uh, monotherapy and then we can discuss the combination of fentramine plus topiramate yeah so like i said fentramine's kind of the old school good old appetite suppressant if you listen to our different podcasts on obesity as a disease, you'll hear us talk about the hypothalamic area in your brain that controls appetite metabolism. And we have this arcuate nucleus where these medications work and their receptors where it works. So so phenamine uh, is what they call a sympathomimetic amine. Um, So it's it's kind of like an amphetamine, but it's not truly amphetamine. It has some amphetamine-like properties. Um, it's a norepinephrine releasing, maybe even a dopamine releasing agent up there in the arcuate nucleus um, that essentially helps uh, as straight up good old appetite suppressant. Um, but it doesn't have what they call euphoria, so that, that kind of drug effect that you might get with amphetamines. Um, it also hasn't been shown to be addictive, which is part of the reason I think why a long time ago it was only approved for three to- uh, three months at a time. And also science, medical professionals, FDA, et cetera, didn't quite understand obesity as a disease. And it was, you know, unfortunately too much of a cosmetic issue. So, um, but that's the way it is. And that's how it is now, <clears throat> um, but when it's used by itself, but different states are, are stricter on it. And there have certainly been plenty of studies and observational, not great randomized trials, but observational data to show it's, it's safe um, for long-term use. Um, generally comes in by itself, 15 milligrams or 37 and a half milligram tablets. There is a relatively newer trademarked uh, eight milligram tablet that is uh, for, for reasons we could debate approved for three times a day dosing. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, by itself, it helps people get, you know, around five to 10% weight loss, uh, versus placebo in short-term trials. And of course, we're going to talk about its combination with topiramate in a controlled release fashion that is approved for long-term use. And so leading up to that, they, they studied, uh, versus 
topiramate versus the combination. And um, in, in that trial, uh, the seven and a half and 15 milligram phenamine resulted in, in about four and a half, five percent uh, more weight loss than placebo, respectively. Um, there's some potential side effects with phenamine. Um, some of those, you know, amphetamine like properties, uh, you know, some maybe people get some agitation, dry mouth, anxiety, insomnia. Um, it can increase heart rate a little bit. So that's been, you know, part of a concern like, well, do, you know, the, the caution with cardiovascular disease risk, um, but it's never been shown to certainly increase any cardiovascular disease risk. So, um, but that, you know, we historically do say to use caution in people with cardiovascular disease. What do you think? Yeah, the OG, uh, we call them OG, original gangsta, um, uh, bariatricians or obesity specialists, they, they, I mean, we went to the conference, I was in medical school, uh, mm -hmm. my brother came with me and we, that's all we had back then, um, uh, pretty much. So everybody was talking about how to optimize, how, how to optimize fentramine. And so it's been used for a long time. A lot of these clinics have been using them long term. You see primary care doctors who will give their patients. I see this all day. Uh, they basically, yeah, I did okay on fentramine, but then I stopped it and regained the weight. That's expected to happen if you understand that obesity is a disease and a chronic, a chronic disease, uh, and, and they are going to continue to have those appetite issues. So that's that's the common thing. I mean, even in residency, I remember, you know, uh, attendings, the, the people that oversee are basically like, yeah, the problem with fentramine is that, you know, you stop it and then they regain the weight. It's like, well, no, no, you, it's meant to be taken long term. Now, there is something called tachyphylaxis uh, where it's thought that maybe over time it becomes <coughs> less effective compared to the drugs we'll talk about next week. But I don't I don't know if there's any evidence to to of that maybe in monotherapy but in combination therapy with uh the the topiramate uh and and fentramine the Qsimia, i'm not sure that is uh an issue but certainly we see the side effects a lot of my patients say i just felt jittery insomnia is probably the worst one uh, i hate it when i don't sleep and if i got insomnia from something <laughs> i would hate that as well jitteriness insomnia anxiety is a common thing i see people there's high prevalence of anxiety out there, especially if you have obesity. And, you know, if it increases that anxiety, that kind of defeats the purpose despite losing weight. It's like, I'm really anxious, but I'm losing weight. It's like that, nobody wants that either. So um, uh, and other contraindications, you're not supposed to use it in hyperthyroidism. Cardiovascular disease, again, uncontrolled, out, uncontrolled, uncontrolled hyperthyroidism. Un uncontrolled hyperthyroidism, right? Yeah. Um, what other what other uh, contraindications? Oh, pregnancy, obviously, we've talked about that in the beginning. But any other specific right. contraindications? Very important. Um, you can't use it with MAOI inhibitors. Um, I think you did. You if anybody's glaucoma. on an MAOI, if anybody's on an MAOI <laughs> all at right. this point, like, but you never know. I, I think I've seen one person, and I was like, wait a second. I looked up the drug because I hadn't seen it before, and I'm like, wait a second. You're on an MAOI. And they're like, yeah, everybody says the same thing when they see me because every other drug interacts with MAOIs, <laughs> and nobody's ever seen it. And you you yeah. said the same thing. It was really funny. But anyway, if you're on an MAOI, I don't take fentramine. It's pretty much I would talk about getting off your MAOI and switching to something else uh, with your doctor. But I've never seen other than one person out of the however many thousands of patients I've interacted with over the years anyway um uh glaucoma yeah uh, yeah uh, um, increased increased so, pressures potentially yeah so yeah i mean that's basically it um yeah i don't know that we need to go through the statistics of the side effects but you know a little bit of dry mouth um like you said you know not a ton of insomnia for the low doses to be honest um, and I'm, yeah. I'm looking right now at that, that old trial that compared fentramine to topiramate and then the combination, uh, the insomnia was reported in 11% of the people on 15 milligrams of fentramine, um, compared to on the seven and a half milligrams, which is similar to the, what we talked about the eight, it was, it was almost the same as placebo. So, you know, that's good. Yeah. I think, I, I think it's, that's you know, it's not horrible. That's if you the take reason it at the right time. That's the reason I like the combination therapy, simply because, you know, you crank them up to 37 and a half milligrams monotherapy, meaning just that drug and not a combination. That's where I think you start seeing the most side effects. I mean, obviously you see it at 15 um, more so than the seven and a half, but uh, that, that's what I would say. Uh, so 
can you t talk about the trials that were done with the combination of fentramine and topiramate that ultimately led to FDA approval of, of long-term uh, use as opposed to 12 weeks, which is what a monotherapy means, yeah. just fentramine by itself? Yeah, so first, topiramate. Well, what the heck is topiramate? Some people might know it as its trade name of Topamax, and then they'll say, well, wait a second, that's called Dopamax because it makes people feel kind of brain fog at, at high doses. But that's because it's a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, that's what it's called, with uh, something called GABA modulation, which is maybe how it works synergistically with phenamine up in that uh, arcuate nucleus area. Um, it's been around, I tell people, forever for treating seizures and migraines. Um, and at high doses like that, for those uh, therapies, it, uh, it, it has more of those side effects, like the, the Dopamax sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> but it's been actually studied by itself historically for weight loss because it really, one of its side effects is taste change. So we call that dyskusia. And it really, it's, it really helps people with like binge eating disorder that we'll talk about um, with somebody who's does has some expertise in uh, medical therapy for, for binge eating disorder. Um, it, it, it can help with other sort of addictions, uh, I think. And, um, and it helps people not like soda pop anymore. So I, do, I use it a ton for people who really feel addicted to soda pop. They just don't like it anymore. It's part of the taste change. But anyways. Tastes taste um, flat. The, uh, the carbonic hydrase, uh, yeah. hydrase makes it taste flat. Like it, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so, so phenamine to pyramid extended release, like I said, in that some of those early trials, when they compare phenamine to 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 the combination uh, by itself showed more weight loss with the combination um, and not a lot more side effects, a few more, but really these reasonable doses that it comes in, in a controlled release fashion, really to some degree mitigate it. Um, and, you know, and we can go through some of those side effects, but basically more than placebo would be things like taste change, dry mouth, a little bit of insomnia, um, some of the anxiety, again, for those different components. Um, we don't, we, we avoid it maybe in people who have a history of kidney stones. Other, like you said, otherwise it's, it's kind of the same contraindications. You can't take it with pregnancy. Topiramate is very teratogenic. Um, it's, you can't, you can't allow a fetus to be exposed to topiramate. That's like the one that's you know, all these medications we talk about, well, we don't want to cause active weight loss in pregnancy. This one you can't have if you get pregnant. So in the labeling, they talk about doing home monthly um, the pregnancy tests, et cetera. But um, <clears throat> like I said, so the combination is definitely better than uh, each individual uh, component by itself. On average, in all the uh, phase three trials compared to placebo, ranging from about seven to nine percent more than uh, placebo, uh, closer to that nine or ten percent when you think about those who actually completed the trials. I think we've mentioned before that obesity treatment trials, they don't have the greatest completion rates, um, which is actually why some of these newer medications are have fairly impressive completion rates, actually. But um, you know, not nine, ten percent for those who are completing that, and that's a, a number that is very clinically meaningful. So, if we think about weight loss percent as a surrogate for what we actually care about, and that's the health of the person, you start getting ten and more percent weight loss. That's where we really see the the great benefits of um, you know improving diabetes, preventing diabetes, maybe even cardiovascular benefit, which this these meds don't have that study yet, but they do have lots of observational data um, to, to suggest there's no increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, so hopefully if you're really responding to it, um, you know, then, then you do. Um, <clears throat> there was a pooled analysis uh, of phase three clinical trials that revealed, um, you know, certainly that it, it reduced the risk of progression to diabetes in those who are at high risk of diabetes, like prediabetes and, and metabolic syndrome. And, um, and, and in those with diabetes, pretty significant glycemic control because they're losing such good weight. Yeah, this, this was the, this was the go-to back uh, 10 years ago for me, uh, until the newer drugs came out that I'll, we'll discuss next uh, week. But, um, it's, it, it's, it works really well. I, t I tend to not give, uh, my older patients over, you know, in the seventies, this medicine just out of just hypothetical, hypothetical risk. It's, 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 it's not been studied. And my brother points out the data doesn't necessarily 
agree with that. It's more hypothetical for me, but you know, I've had many young patients. They they've gone on to lose 20, 25% of their weight from Qsimia, even on the lower doses of it. So, uh, which Qsimia again is fentramine plus topiramate uh, combination therapy. So, the the idea is that you combine different little drugs that have different types of effects, and there might be synergy. It, you know, some might say it's additive. There might be synergy, but you don't get the side effects from having to crank up one of them. Like topiramate, this, most of my patients will start getting side effects. <clears throat> Uh, when you start increasing there, and, and, and fentramine too. So you keep them in the lower doses. They they both hit the receptors in the brain uh, differently, and then there's additive or maybe even synergistic effects potentially, and that way you don't get the side effects, but you get the benefit. That's that's the whole uh, reasoning behind it. And actually, um, I have patients that are on those newer drugs that we'll talk about next week, the GLP-1s and Qsimia, and it, and it results in just massive amounts of weight loss but that hasn't really been studied other than in kind of our little case studies here but um interesting stuff anything else we need to say yeah. about uh, and uh, well so i think yeah you know we're talking about it long-term therapy so we do have long-term extension trials so uh one of the big trials um they the, the people who completed it uh, they gave them the option to continue it on for, for two years and uh, not huge numbers, but uh, several hundreds of people, 230 people in the placebo arm, <clears throat> over 150 people in the in the, the usual dose of fentramine topiramate or Qsimia, and then nearly 300 people in the higher dose of Qsimia went on to complete two years of therapy. Um, and again, you know, around eight to nine percent placebo subtracted weight loss at one year. Um, they were able to maintain between seven and eight and a half percent weight loss at two years. And if you remember us talking about that categorical weight loss, again, that 10 percent weight loss goal, over 50 percent of people were able to get over that 10 percent weight loss, um, you know, over that two years. And that's you know, that is very clinically meaningful. And uh, a third of people were able to get 15% weight loss. So, and that's over two years. And so that's, you know, that really is important for uh, what we really care about. It's literally what's on the inside that counts, right? So, um, yeah, so I think that's important. I use a lot of fentermine topiramate, actually. I think, and it might have to do with the fact that you're virtual. You, fentermine, it, so we didn't yeah. talk about it. It's a controlled substance, which I, I was just telling people today on my virtual clinic, it really shouldn't be based upon the data. Like I said, it hasn't been found to be addictive. It's been shown to be safe for long-term use, um, but it's just a historical you know, FDA issue in different states or whatever. And so it's a controlled substance. So it does take a little bit of a, you know, it, that causes some barriers. And so it's a barrier for you because you practice across straight, state lines virtually. And so you, more or less, it's a, it's kind of a legal issue, unfortunately. Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's clinically unfortunate fine, but... it's 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 a much uh, more affordable medicine than these new kind of more biological peptides that mm -hmm. are are still patented. You know, fentramine. Well, technically, the Qsimia uh, is is um, it's a trade uh, drug, but you know, technically, I should be able to do generic fentramine plus topiramate. But given the given the laws. I do not do it, and it's unfortunate because I, I would feel very comfortable doing it um, virtually if if legally I were allowed to. So it, I, I don't think yeah. it's a bad I, thing, it's especially, I would say especially younger patients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and so, and for more information, you know, I again we're not we're not shilling out medications, but the trade medications do have pretty good information on their website. So this trade name is Qsimia. Uh, so if you go to, you know, www.qsimia.com, Q-S-Y-M-I-A.com, I got that right, right? They talk about how to get it. You start with a little baby dose daily for two weeks, then you go to the usual dose. If you respond to it, meaning if you get 3% weight loss in the first few months, then that means you're probably going to do pretty well with it in the long run. And so you stick with that. If you don't quite get it, you can go to another intermediate dose for a couple of weeks. And then that full dose we were talking about, uh, which is 15 milligrams of phenamine and um, 92 milligrams of the topiramate. And then really, you, you should get at least a 5% weight loss response in the early time. And then you'll probably get that, you know, 10 or more percent weight loss uh, in the long run. And they, they because coverage is an issue, they these companies have struck deals with some mail order pharmacies to help with the cost burden. And so, um, 
so Qsimia does have that deal. So if you go to the website, talk to your physician, again, think about the pros and cons, risk benefits, um, <clears throat> how you have to monitor it, et cetera. So, but it's, it's, it's a good medicine overall and, uh, and definitely has its uh, benefits for a lot of people I have. Yeah. Next, let's discuss bupropion and naltrexone with the trade name of Contrave, although I think there are a lot of people that prescribe uh, the medicine separately uh, to have mm -hmm. the effect, which is what I tend to do just due to cost uh, reasons. Um, so yeah, nal uh, naltrexone and bupropion, let's go over that. So yeah, naltrexone might sound somewhat familiar to people because it's very similar to something called Narcan or naloxone, which is an opioid antagonist. So the people who are unfortunately having issues with opioid pain meds and, and overdosing on them, the treatment, the anecdote to that is naloxone or Narcan. Well, naltrexone is also an opioid, opiate antagonist. Um, and the reason that works is because bupropion, which has been around for a long time for um, it's an anti-depression medication. It's been used for smoking cessation. So, you know, you start to realize what's going on when we're talking about some of these addiction hormones in the brain. Um, it's a dopamine norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, meaning more of that is around in the brain. And so again, going up to that hypothalamus, that, that palm C area in the arcuate nucleus, that is what is important for targeting to go up to other neurons in the brain to help people with appetite, craving, satiety, etc. The bupropion essentially signals to the that palm C neuron, but there is some negative feedback of endorphins. So kind of like when you exercise and you feel really good, that's your endorphins. Those it's kind of like an opioid kind of thing. Well, the naltrexone then blocks that for some synergism. And in the early trials, again, where they you know, they've looked at these in isolation before, right? So uh, people obviously came up with this idea of combining these things. So bupropion for smoking cessation and, and uh, depression has always been known to be, you know, somewhat uh, maybe a little beneficial for weight as opposed to some of the medications that seem to work against people. Um, <clears throat> and so in the, in the trials where they looked at the dosing for these uh, head to head, now Trexone by itself doesn't really do much bupropion by itself does a little, you know, you get a couple percent weight loss on average. Some people certainly respond better that, than that. But then when you start combining the two, you start seeing statistically significant, at least in those early trials, more like, you know, four or 5% placebo subtracted weight loss um, compared to the, you know, the 2% with the bupropion and not much at all by itself with the, the naltrexone. Um, and so that's kind of how it, how it works. And, um, you know, because of the dopamine part of that whole thing, you know, it really seems to uh, work well for people who have that hedonic, that the cravings, the that dopamine reward center issue with foods. And there, there are some studies that talk about that, like food cues, you know, and then we can even talk about the Mayo study that that divided people up into phenotypes last year um, when we talk about it. But on average or so, um, you know, in, in these big trials, it seems like bupropion naltrexone together uh you know four or five percent placebo subtracted weight loss across the board which is not amazing on average i think there are certain people who respond to this well that we'll get to um i, I find it a little bit of a, a problem that the dosing is an issue just because it's kind of annoying so you have to take one pill daily for a week and then one pill twice a day for a week and then a week of two pills in the morning and one in the after or one in the evening and then ultimately getting up to two pills twice a day and again this is one where you really need to pay attention to that early response to therapy i think people know they'll say oh my god this helps my cravings and my food addiction my carb addiction whatever it is and they're the ones that'll hit that five percent weight loss at 12 weeks um, which really does predict a much better weight loss later on again more like eight nine ten percent weight loss. But there are also a lot of common side effects if you want to touch on those. Well, real quick, I, I, I think you forgot to mention naltrexone has also been used for alcohol dependence yeah. or cessation. That's it right. helps. So it's another, it's a, so we, we got a drug that helps with alcohol cessation and cravings. We have a, another drug combined it that, that works for smoking cessation. So synergistically so by themselves they don't really help with weight loss naltrexone doesn't bupropion has a slight effect on weight loss and then it kind of goes away over time 
So there's truly a synergistic. It's not even additive like we were talking about with maybe uh, the Qsimia, fentramine, topiramate. Mm-hmm. You combine them, and it's truly synergistic because you wouldn't see this uh, weight loss with one or the other. Um, I, I've noticed that just a, it's hit or miss. I was so excited. It was like 2013 or 14 when it came out, and I was like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start getting all my patients on this because I love bupropion, and, and it seems to be um, – you know, it's, it's, it's like my antidepressant of choice for patients, even though they're, even if it doesn't work as well as some of the SSRIs, cause I'm like, wait, negative, uh, yeah. uh, antidepressant. Let's start with this, uh, give people more energy anyway. Um, unfortunately when I started prescribing it, it's like the first five people I, I prescribed this contrave, which is a combination, not one versus the other, meaning monotherapy of giving naltrexone by itself and bupropion by itself. I gave contrave, which is a combination of the two which has the dosing that my brother described earlier, uh, it, the results for me were, for patients was horrible. It, side effects were like, I don't know, I'd give bupropion before and people's blood pressure wouldn't spike up to 200 over 120. I was like, what? Are you kidding me? Blood pressure spikes like crazy. Someone had just horrible headaches and I was like, and then people just weren't even losing weight. But once in a while, someone, as my brother described, would say, holy cow, this is totally taking away my cravings and is exactly what I needed. And boom, those people will lose 10, 20% of their weight. Um, it's just unfortunately not as common. Uh, and maybe they would have that except that the side effects were so terrible. So uh, the, the most common things I saw were just headaches, high blood pressure, uh, maybe some jitteriness. Oh, and insomnia. Insomnia is another one uh, that I would see because of the bupropion. Nausea can happen because of naltrexone. Uh, a little bit, but uh, that's what the combination, in in my experience, the combination of the two works better than the monotherapy of e- of each, uh, because it it does sub- takes away some of that nausea you'd get from the naltrexone, because naltrexone comes in fifty milligram tablets. So the way I usually start it is a half a tablet with at in the evening, and, and unfortunately, just twenty five milligrams by itself can sometimes cause uh, that nausea. Not so much with the the bupropion, but um, reasons you can't take the medicines. Uh, obviously, if you're on there an are, opioid, there are a lot of those. You don't want to take this. <laughs> yeah, if you're on an opioid, you, I always tell my patients, like, hey, p- please make sure you tell me, are you taking? Are you going to have surgeries soon? Because I sometimes use opioids. Mm-hmm. You're not going to be happy because it will negate the effect. And obviously, if you're chronically on them, you don't <laughs> want to withdraw f- real quick from. You're not going to be uh, happy uh, with me. But uh, again. Uh, it's, I think it's acute angle closure glaucoma. I think it's, it's, it's a specific yep. type of glaucoma. I'm pretty sure that's the one. If you have a history of seizures, bupropion lowers the seizure threshold. Um, and I don't mm-hmm. mess around. Like if they had epilepsy when they were younger, or a few seizures, I'm like, ah, it doesn't work well enough for me to even take the chance. Um, I don't know. Anything else? What am I missing? Yeah, well, so along those lines, drug and alcohol withdrawal, I think because of the risk of seizure, because of lowering that seizure threshold. And also, now this probably wouldn't make any sense anyways necessarily, but people who have anorexia nervosa um, and, and maybe even bulimia nervosa, just because, again, there's there's some of that seizure threshold stuff. Um, you know, you mentioned the thing about blood pressure. Now, in the studies, blood pressure didn't go through the roof. But it was noted that it seemed to not improve like you would expect for people who lose weight. So if you lose weight, your blood pressure should improve. Now, those who really respond to it, uh, if we start splitting the hairs, probably do have improved all of their cardiometabolic, uh, you know, metabolic markers, those surrogate markers like blood pressure. But it is uh, technically counterindicated for if you have uncontrolled high blood pressure. Um, other things to think about are, you know, uh, you know, generalized anxiety disorder, you know, severe depression, because we're not using it for depression. Although a lot of people say, hey, this is something to consider if you're trying to treat both obesity in people who have depression and it's, and the bupropion would be a reasonable depression medication, like you were saying earlier. Um, But you just have to be aware that sometimes these things can um, exacerbate depression, you know, especially in like younger patients you hear about your family practice. I don't, I don't get, I don't treat people's depression really anymore. Um, you know, I work with the psychiatrist and the family and the primary care doctors. So, um, you know, what, what, what's your take on that? Cause that's why they say that, you know, because of the, sometimes the worsening, like the suicidal ideation, uh, in young people who, who start some of these antidepressant meds. 
Yeah, I just I monitor them. I mean, with telemedicine, I can monitor extremely closely. And if there's any change in mood, I like within days, I'm like, boom, stop it. I, I don't mess around. Uh, you can see that with topiramate, by the way, too, for whatever reason. You know, I, I, I've seen all sorts of even the newer drugs, the GLP ones that we're going to discuss next week. I've seen some interesting mood changes once in a while. It's rare, but uh, you never know what you're going to get. These are very powerful medicines that have powerful effects on the brain. That I, I don't know. I don't know why some people react differently, but um, yeah, that's why I personally like to monitor everyone very closely for side effects in case you just you got to stop them and it's not worth. You know, trying to lose weight if you're going to have worsening of other effects. Yeah. Well, and and speaking of side effects, of course, the other thing, again, the blood pressure and the history of weight loss meds is what about the cardiovascular safety? So there was a mm -hmm. big, huge, this one actually had a, a big cardiovascular outcome trial that, that was going on. And it actually looked very reassuring. Um, just to mention the common side effects, because this is the biggest trial they had, they it was the gastrointestinal effects, 14% versus about 2% in the placebo arm. So that is consistent with what I see. I actually see more nausea and headaches than anything else. Those are the two things that I, I hear about from patients, but then also the central nervous system symptoms, 5% versus 1% in this trial. But this big cardiovascular outcome trial had almost 9,000 patients in it. Um, they were 61 years old. Uh, not bad as far as like 50 50 male female um and a third of them had a history of cardiovascular disease and 85 percent had diabetes so you need to have high cardiovascular risk in these trials to really show you know safety and and potentially benefit because that would be great right we want to see if we can reduce cardiovascular events and the early what they do with these trials is they they look at interim data so that uh you know the safety analysis people can can you know either stop it if it's dangerous or you know sometimes you can actually stop things early because of obvious benefit and then it's like unethical not to give it to people and so when they did that 25 percent when they were 25 percent through all the events that interim analysis um it really looked like a statistically significant benefit and me i you know i don't know exactly what happened but the data were leaked and those of you who understand you know people think oh doctors and scientists were all like no we're people who do this stuff are very um tight and do these things correctly and maybe the company uh got i don't know what happened but they they leaked the data that got it approved and so then they had to stop this trial because it was compromised. And so they ended up getting a little bit past the 50% mark. And by that point, that benefit that it showed early on really seemed to kind of disappear. There wasn't a risk necessarily, but now we don't really know from a big randomized controlled trial. So it's really unfortunate um, that that happened. It still maybe had a hint in the, in the beneficial direction but um there was also a lot of dropout because of those those side effects and and some people don't respond to the medications like we said this one doesn't have as much good response rate as some of the other medications and so there's a lot of dropout in in this trial and so that maybe caused some issues the good news is that meta-analyses of this medication um that include by the way bupropion for smoking cessation um you know which those people have high cardiovascular risk it it sure looks like it's at least safe it's not, uh, you know, we, we yeah. don't know about the benefit. Um, again, I would go back to the data we have that show if we can get over 10% weight loss, um, you know, without causing harm, that probably there is a benefit, uh, but we don't at absolutely know for sure with this one because of that trial, which is, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. It, it is really too bad. It was the, what is it? The light, the light trial, I believe it was. And it was a big deal, whatever it was in 20. 16 or 15 or whatever uh, i don't know mm -hmm. that it was this whole thing happened we were all pretty upset about it <laughs> because it's like all right well it'd be <laughs> nice to have this long-term long-term data uh that we could just say hey it, it would have been really nice to have that fentramine a similar uh cardiovascular uh, outcome fentramine data i think yeah. too that would put that to rest yeah and um, anyway and, and what my, else, my what impression is that there is some ongoing anything? trial well, so, so I do want to talk about, because we talked about how, uh, you know, bupropion naltrexone seems to have this uh, benefit in that, you know, those hedonic reward system areas. 
and you know they've talked about the improvement in food cues. So when we're thinking about who might benefit from these meds, who is going to be the person to respond to this therapy and get the most benefit and bang for their buck, it's those types of people. So interestingly, there was a, a publication last year from the Mayo Clinic group that they took 450 people with obesity and they they tried to split them up to these different, what they called pheno, obesity phenotypes based upon their body composition, their resting energy expenditure, their description of their own satiety, their eating behavior, their affect and their physical activity. Um, and then they tried to use that and, and use the different weight loss medications we have to sort of guide therapy based upon the phenotype. And this was a randomized trial. There were some issues with how this trial was <laughs> planned and done. So there are, there's a lot of skepticism, but it does at least make sense. And so they broke them up into a group with abnormal satiation. They called it the hungry brain. And those people got the phenamine topiramate combination that we talked about. They also got a different medication that we're not going to get into because it was taken off the market called Lorcasrin or Belvic. But then they, they had a group with abnormal hedonic eating or emotional hunger. And they're the people that got the naltrexone bupropion. And what the bottom line is, what they showed in this trial, again, there were some issues with how this was done, but the people who got the medication based upon that phenotype they came up with were the ones who really responded well uh, to the medications. And uh, that group got, you know, well over like 15% weight loss compared to the non-phenotyped group, which was more in that single digit, uh, you know, seven to nine percent weight loss. And again, everyone got medicine, right? So they're all getting pretty good weight loss along with diet and exercise, um, but also a lot more of that categorical weight loss. So, you know, we're talking, you know, 80% of people just across the board who were phenotyped meaning got the medication that kind of fit their phenotype, uh, we're getting 10% uh, weight loss. So, and, and I'll tell you anecdotally, that fits. So all the data that says, hey, the people who describe that sort of emotional craving, food addiction sort of thing, if there aren't other contraindications to the bupropion naltrexone contrave combination, they do seem to be the people who, who get pretty good benefit out of it. Um, and uh, and are the ones who who actually truly respond to it, and um, and and fit the the good data that that we have, and uh, I don't know what what you think about that. Do you have any experience or thoughts on that? Yeah, that's that tends to be the case. Now I think we should probably do a poll podcast on that phenotyping because as we're going to get into mm. the next lecture, <laughs> the new drugs blow all of that. It just it, it it makes it all moot in my opinion unless we're looking at cost. Um, <laughs> to the whole thing because these newer drugs do work on on those parts of the brain as well and if i had to guess they work better uh again i am i swear to god i'm not getting paid by these drugs. <laughs> i yeah. swear to god i'm not getting paid but <laughs> yeah. i love them i love them i love them i love it i love it no nope, nope. you're trying <laughs> you're, you're getting paid that's for <laughs> no he's not i'm, I'm just jump joking. on the couch right but, now so the, well, okay the but i love these drugs <laughs> And anybody who is not watching this on YouTube, uh, Spencer's leg is in the air and he's saying, I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it, ah, yeah. But, um, but, 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 but so, but you bet, you did make a very good point though. You said cost. And so this is, yes. I think we have a little bit of a differing opinion. We have to consider cost benefit ratios. And so, you know, if you go back to our other podcasts, we talk about those with obesity have a more severe disease if they have complications or at higher risk of complications and they're the ones that really get the most benefit so for example we go back to that um i, I mentioned that trial of phenamine topiramate in people with metabolic syndrome and and pre-diabetes well our one of our idols that i i get the pleasure of working with tim garvey he used his cardiometabolic disease staging system to sort of break that up and those who had multiple components of metabolic syndrome and prediabetes compared to those who really had what it, like true metabolically healthy obesity without any of those things, they got a ton, of, like the number needed to treat was very low. It was like in the 20s compared to darn near 100 for the other group to delay and prevent diabetes. So when we think about cost effectiveness and, and just absolute effectiveness, obviously those people with more severe disease got that. Now, we could also take that to the cost of these medications. So the new medications, yeah, they cost a lot of money. Somebody's paying for it. 
we also have dysfunction in the United States that we're going to get somebody else with better expertise on us to explain why that is, where because it is more expensive here than other places. So um, so I, I do think both Contrave and Qsimia, the trade names that we're talking about today, absolutely have their role for if we get them to the right people, those people respond, don't have a lot of side effects, and it, and it can be very cost effective with really good benefits, really. But but yes, head to head, straight up, and, and there are some of these... Uh, we have these network meta analyses, you know, that kind of try to compare the best they can. There are no head to head trials, really, other than like, you know, liraglutide versus semaglutide that we'll talk about next time. Um, and they've compared liraglutide to Orlistad. And, you know, they've kind of compared some of these. And so they do a, what's called a network meta analysis. Um, and certainly, uh, what, what we've seen from those is that the phenamine topiramate of the pills has. The, the best odds ratio of helping people achieve that 5% weight loss, which ultimately leads to an even better response. Um, uh, but there's also the, 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 um, the issue of side effects, right? So in these same network meta-analyses, <laughs> phenamine, topiramate, naltrexam, bupropion, you know, and even liraglutide, um, you know, also seem to have the, the most likely, uh, adverse effects. <laughs> so of, of, um, I don't know if it was discontinuing, but at least the most, you know, adverse effects. Um, but then when you throw in there the newer medications, the most recent meta-analysis, of course, had included semaglutide that we'll talk about, the weekly drug called Wegovi. And yeah, it was like, yeah, this this kind of beats them all. And we know that. Yeah. I mean, that's obvious, as we'll, we'll talk about in the next one. So, But they all have different side effects. They have different pros and cons. And there is a cost issue. There, uh, so, you know, we, I think we have to think about that. Yeah, I think it costs a consideration. I will say I do use combination therapy with the newer drugs and all of these other ones. Uh, so, I mean, like, I think, and, and I've seen benefit. It would just be cool to study it, actually. And it's just hard to, you know, we don't even have studies on people on all sorts of different drugs. So it's kind of it's kind of hard to, to there's only yeah. so much money to go around to study things. So, um all right, I think I think that kind of yeah. does well, it for this. Uh, you know, to that, I mean, unless you have something else, that's why yeah. we have to publish. Well, we have to publish case studies. I mean, you know, so several years ago, because of what exactly you just said, we had no data comparing, or you know, in people who took both liraglutide, the daily uh, medication called Saxenda, and something like phenamine topiramate or Qsimia. So we happened to when I was. Uh, faculty at Walter Reed, we had five patients, or it was only three patients, I think, who had very severe obesity, by the way, with complicated by type 2 diabetes. And so we treated them with max dose. They all responded to liraglutide, um, but they still had clinical room to improve, right? So they lost weight, they improved their clinical situation, and we added phenamine topiramate. And then they all, all three of these people responded further and uh, you know, put their diabetes into remission, got off all sorts of other medications. So we published that case uh, report in endocrine practice, but it's not a randomized controlled trial. It's just showing that there are people who, if we do this correctly um, within our, you know, when we, when we think about the pros, cons, again, cost, effectiveness stuff we have to think about. So, so we have to, you know, publish those things. That's why we have observational data and stuff like that. It, nothing, it's not always going to be perfect randomized controlled trial data, but um, yeah, anything else I, um, with these medications? No, there's nothing else other than I will say zonisamide is similar to topiramate, carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, um, has similar effects to topiramate, and some people combine that with bupropion. That was a drug, if they were looking at that combination, I use those separately with some patients, but honestly, uh, still lots of side effects, potential benefit. Um, uh, I, I think I think people are going to enjoy this lecture or this podcast, and then I think they're going to like even more the next one. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, and then we're all going broke because the next one's really expensive. All right, perfect. We'll talk about the next podcast. Here's our outro. This podcast is for entertainment and education and information purposes only. Remember, the physicians on this podcast are not your physician. It should not be considered professional or personalized medical advice. It should not be used to replace speaking with your physician or medical professional to discuss your specific health concerns. The topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose or treat any condition. As a result, we are not responsible for any unwanted medical outcomes. The views and opinions discussed are of those of the host only and do not represent those of any other entities. Thank <laughs> you.